Hello, I'm Dr. Ahmed Abdelal, and this is the third part of the articulation and resonance unit of the speech and hearing science for students of speech and hear, uh, speech language pathology uh, or communication sciences and disorders. So now we are going to speak about the production of stops slash plosives, fricatives, and affricate sounds. In the previous two videos, um, actually three videos, uh, we discussed the first uh, parts. There are two, part one, part two, and there is one that complements part one and two. And then this is the third and last uh, lecture. Remember that the sounds, as we started to discuss them, the consonants particularly, we are speaking about consonant sounds, they are all produced with turbulence. There is some obstruction, it's like when there's a boulder in a river and the water comes in, it hits the bound, you know, the, the, the border becomes, um, I mean, the boulder becomes an obstacle and the water comes in and hits and then goes, or, goes back and goes around. So when there is an obstacle, that backing up creates uh, um, turbulence and speech is produced with turbulence, especially speech uh, sounds that are consonant sounds. So always, always, when you say consonant, it has some kind of obstruction and that obstruction can be partial or can be complete. So we divide all sounds into vowels and consonants. Now we addressed all the 14 English vowels. Now we are looking at the consonants and consonants are grouped into two large groups. The first group that we discussed before is called resonant sounds or resonant phonemes or resonant consonant phonemes. And then the second category is non-resonant phonemes. So resonant phonemes are produced with less obstruction. There is obstruction, but it, in, in these sounds, the airway continues to be open and the sound can, is continuous. Like when you say, mm, and so on. So these sounds, you can indefinitely, it's almost have very similar char characteristics to vowels. But uh, because there is some obstruction, it makes them classified as consonants. But in the production of resonant sounds, the reason we call them resonant consonants is that the entire vocal tract resonates when you produce resonant consonants. Non-resonant consonants um, are produced with significant obstruction anywhere between from the vocal folds to the lips anywhere there is a significant obstruction that can be complete stoppage of the air flow or partial blockage so when the the blockage occurs only the distance in front of the between the blockage and the lips only that space will be available for resonance. Only the air in front of the obstruction is going to resonate. So now this brings us up, uh, brings us to the relationship between volume and resonance again. And the, back to the, the material we studied before, the rule says the greater the volume is, the you got it right, the lower the resonant frequency. And the smaller the volume is, the higher the resonant frequency. So in any of these stops, fricatives, affricates, always think about where the stoppage is, where the obstruction is, 
and how big is the distance between that obstruction uh, and the lips. So that is going to determine the size of the space available, will tell you if the frequency is going to be higher or lower than other sounds. So there will be many questions targeting this that are based on where a sound is produced, and you need to just use your mind to figure the answers out, um, as you will see. So we classified the sounds. Let me go quickly to the chart, um, put it in the middle so that it can be accessible for both, uh, for all sounds. So here, so we said, here are the stop sounds, one pair, one cognate pair, two cognate pairs, three, and the single that doesn't have a pair, uh, that doesn't have another one to go with. So seven sounds, these are called stops or plosive sounds. It depends if where you are focusing on. Are you, do you focus on the stopping of the airway or do you focus on what happens after the stopping, you know, when you produce that plosion? So it doesn't matter to us. So we, this is what we are going to speak about. And we discussed the characteristics of of this last time when we took them voicing, placement, and manner. So today we're gonna uh, continue our discussion on the stops, and then we'll go to the fricatives and the affricates, and then we just speak about uh, some common features uh, about that have to do with suprasegmentals of speech and stressed syllables. So, the production of stops is characterized by a complete blockage of the airway somewhere along the vocal tract. So you can trace this from the beginning, from the lips and go back. At the lips, there are two sounds that, that you produce with this, P and B. We know which one is voiced, which one is not. So P, B. Second station is the alveolar ridge. You make and d. Third, you go back and you get the k and g. And lastly, you go to the glottis and between the vocal folds and you say ah, oh! and that is, as you say, ka, ka n, ba n. So these are the seven sounds. You, again, you block, hold, and explode the air because th there will be a lot of air pressure building up and then you make a plosion. So that the, there's an increase in intraoral pressure. Intraoral is inside of the oral cavity. The pressure interoral, that is symbol taken from French. So the pressure rises when you, as you increase the duration, when you stop, the air pressure increases, air wants to force itself out so it can breathe. So once you release, there's a little, um, a little plosion and the air then is strong, strongly streaming out, but the air drops immediately after you release the stop. So only if you come to situations where, for example, the, um, the stop sound is followed by a nasal, um, like when you say hidden, hidden, so the, it's not flowed, like you don't say kid, you know, Daniel, de, de, so, or pa, pat, or pam, there's a significant, um, there's a significant uh, flow of air or aspiration that we call, or we call it aspiration. So the oral release um, leads to the, the release of um, like a, some aspiration or some air uh, going after that air is, is usually, um, it makes a transient noise as you see when you say, he, he, so, or um, any, any one of these, and I'm sorry, that's not a stop. As you say, for example, um, uh, tight, so what comes after is usually that uh, a puff of air that comes out and it is, you know, aperiodic. So, um, 
you can hear the release in the form of you know, you know for example the, the the airstream making that strong um sound uh, uh, when you say pa, ta, da. so we'll we'll continue to to see how these work so the stops as you could see from the chart there are let me go back to the chart again look at the the kinds of stops that we have as i trace them here there are two at the lips so we call them bilabial stops and here they are bilabial stops so this is the placement this is the uh, voicing and this is the manner so then we have the alveolar stops too and then we have the velar stops and then we have the glottal stop uh. so for the labial stops uh, the orbicularisaurus muscle is the main active muscle to basically enable you to close seal the lips hold them and then you know occlude uh, them uh, and then the alveolar stops alveolar ridge the tongue tip contacts the alveolar ridge so we discussed before that that muscle that originates on the anterior surface of the chin and just just fans back and curves up like this and it serves as the bulk of the tongue it's an extrinsic lingual muscle or glossal muscle and that is the genioglossus so the genioglossus enables you to press the tongue against the alveolar ridge so the super longitudinal muscle is going to help to contract to help you lift up the tongue tip and then you place it now on the alveolar ridge the, the uh, genioglossus then enables you to protrude it toward the alveolar ridge and to put pressure on the alveolar ridge to make the sounds so the alveolar stops are t and d one is voiceless and one is voiced and remember the two muscles that are involved the superior longitudinal lifts up the tongue tip but it cannot it cannot put pressure on the alveolar ridge because it contracts like this so but you need the tongue to be placed against the alveolar ridge and to push to to push press against it and the genioglossus is the one that's gonna bring the tongue forward and enable you to push to make the tongue and then the pillar stops we have the styloglossus styloid process uh, and tongue and that muscle is going to elevate the uh, tongue um, and pull it uh, back um, uh, similar to it's also involved in making the ooh sound so also you have the palatoglossus. We said the palatoglossus can either bring down the palate, the soft palate, or it can elevate it. So if you fixate the top, you're gonna bring the tongue up. If you fixate the, the lingual, the, the part that's attached to the tongue, then you bring the soft palate down, depending on what movement you want to accomplish. So the palatoglossus and the styloglossus, there is the tongue dorsum, the back of the tongue. And they also the tongue then contacts the velar the, uh, veal or the palate or the palatal, um, uh, uh, the, the velum or the palate um, or the soft palate I'm sorry either the the little placement on the hard palate or the soft palate because it comes at the boundary between the soft palate and the hard palate depending on the context for example try this if you say oh, oh, ug, ha, hug, hug, okay see it and see feel where the g is, is made ha, hug now, what, what sound are, are we producing? Or maybe let's make it even more concrete. Uh, let's say um, a sound like ooh, oog, oog. It's not a word, but just let's put the sound ooh, because it's back. And let's um, say g, oog, oog. Now say ah, uh, og, og. So here, but now say eeg, eeg, eeg. The reason is, when you say e, your tongue is out, is out already, far onto the front, and you make a g. So while your tongue is coming back, it chooses the closest spot to it coming back, and it stops and it makes the e. So that will make the g more anterior, more toward the hard palate. Okay. So in that case, the production is palatal. In that case, or the contact is palatal. But if the sound is is a back sound and the tongue is already in the back and it needs to move forward, it also chooses the closest position to the back. So when you say og versus eeg, you can, if you try and close your eyes, maybe you, you are going to find that the placements of the g are very different. It is e is a front vowel. So naturally, as you keep going back, you come to the closest area, which is 
basically it will place it in the palatal, the, the end of the heart palate. But because the ah is coming from here, then as you keep going forward to get the contact between the velum and the tongue, then the placement will be velar, will be velar. Depends. So the context, the phonetic context, what comes before the sound, what comes after, will determine the exact nature of the sound. And then the glottal stop, glottis, the, at the, in the space between the vocal folds, we said two, only two sounds are produced. The glottal stop, which is up, as in cut and bop, and, and the ha sound. So both of them, even though, ironically, they occur, both of them occur at the glottis between the source of the vocalization, between the vocal folds, both of them are voiceless. So in the uh, uh, glottis, the, uh, the vocal folds are wide open like this, and you go ha, and they slam, and they just go away. No vibration. So now, in terms of the acoustics, what do the formats look like on a spectrogram? So we, in order to make first to to make the sound and to compare it to the context, we put the a sound say ah at the beginning and ah at the and the other side, and we say the ah pa, and then this way you are vocalizing the ah, and then you produce the pa, and then you continue vocalizing another ah. So you know how this is going to fit within a particular context. So here. Ah, uh, the same characteristics uh, are about 900 for F1, and then uh, F2 is higher, and the F3 is, uh, you know, higher. And we discussed that. So then there's a silent peer, uh, gap. See, uh, there's nothing. As the, This is real timing. It tells you the number of seconds that this sound is taking. And the wider the band here, the longer, like this sound, lasted longer than this sound. Okay, so the wider... The, the format is, in terms of the, as you see it visually, the longer the sound lasts. So you can see now when you say, ah, pa, the ah at the beginning lasts much less, almost half the length of the pa at the end. Probably because of the release of the sound, pa, it gives more of a, more of a continua continuation of the ah. So ah, pa, and also the stress too. So you put a stress on the, on the pa in that case, and that will make the second, um, the second sound longer. And then discuss um, this uh, aspect of stress later at the end of the slides. So you can see now, here is a side, you vocalize ah, and then the silent gap, that means the stopping when you say the blockage of the airway, when you say the pa. But then as you release, then you see this band of noise, the pa, pa, pa is voiceless. So, but this, the, the sound, the frequency of it is gonna be very low, like in 300. And then you get some activity up, but that activity continues up to 7,000, but not significant. But then as you continue, this is all air coming out, but then you continue, this is aperiodic, and then you continue now to switch to all ah, your vocal folds start to vibrate. But there's a gap between, a gap between the P here. See that tiny gap between the P and the ah. Okay, that area here is called voice onset. The difference between moving from the stop sound to the, to the vocal sound ah. And uh, so you don't see any activity. There's a long gap here between the sound P and A. Ah. Now let's look and see here, as compared to the voiced uh, cognate B. So you say A, ah, these are the same characteristics like this. However, your system knows that you're gonna come to a voiced sound, you say A, ah, ba, A, ah, ba. So the energy, there's more energy in A ah, in that case, A, ah, ba, because there's not much, the, the constriction is not long. You don't hold your lips like too long, ah, uh, bah. Uh, but for the pa, you continue, you, like the pressure is stronger. So the fact that ba is voiceless, uh, and, and here you almost see the, the stop, and then not much like aspiration here or air noise coming out, and then you switch immediately to the other, ah, uh, uh, bah, ah, uh, bah. So the transition is, it comes faster here because this sound is voiced and this sound is also voiced. Uh, when the same situation happens with ta and da, except for ta is going to produce more energy, more noise energy at the end in the range between 4,000 and 6,000. And here the da doesn't produce much except for the first format. So you can see when you say ah, ta, ah, and the stop, this is the number of seconds that the, the, the stop lasts, and then ta, ta, and then the release and the silence between, uh, and in the beginning here between the ta and the start of vocalization, there's a, there's a little bit of lag between ending saying the uh, and the beginning of vibration for the ah, uh, for the following vowel. So now you notice here's F1, F2, and F3. As you go out, uh, and then you, you block, 
then there's a little bit of transition here, a little bit. But then you block, and then there is the production, the release of data as a periodic noise. And then you there's a tiny gap, a little lag between the, the production of data and the vocalization. And then ah, ah, ta. So you get ah, very low, much lower here uh, than 900. But it is um, affected by the ta being voiceless. Yeah. Ah, ta. Because the, some, some um, noise gets into it, some of that aspirated uh, you know, air comes and affects the uh, to make the frequency much lower than usual. Uh, and remember also that the tongue is out making contact with the alveolar ridge. Uh, so that makes the, the, the frequency lower. You have F2 and you have F3. Uh, now, uh, when you say uh, da, uh, da, that's the voiced form, the cognate of, of the. So you notice there isn't that noise that's coming up because that is the, the has a periodic tone from the vocal folds. And the da, da, it doesn't have as much noise. It just has the stopping. And then as you release, it's kind of a, doesn't have much noise. And ah, uh, da, ah, uh, da, because it, this is voiced and this is voiced coming after it. So you can see now, ah, uh, da, as you move, you transition from the ah uh to the da. Now ah uh, is getting back to its normal 900 kind of a F1. And then you continue and this switch, you go up. Actually, you go a little bit lower for the, the F2. So these are just some characteristics and, and you notice the same pattern. But look here, when they are voiceless, you see a longer gap. A longer lag here. You see noise here. That is the aspiration uh, coming up, and the k -k, and that is also the same. But you don't find that in the voicing, in the voice. And you can see how, if you measure the distance from this to this, you can see how long this is compared to how long this is. And the voiceless ones, you you block the air for a longer time. When you release, there's more noise that is making the periodic noises, and and then the the um, voiced ones have a shorter duration in the stopping and in the release. And also, you don't see. Uh, you do not see signs of noise here in that case. The ga is also voiced a uh, ga. And so, you know, practice and say this and you can have a better feel of, of them. So the idea is that all these tasks are characterized by something called a silent gap where you stop completely. There's no activity on the spectrogram and that is then released into a, a puff of air that comes out depending on if the sound is voiceless or voiced. Uh, the, the release is going to show as noise and the bands that go up to say, you know six or seven thousand um, and then they are characterized again by the voice onset time that is the time between producing the actual sound the stop and transitioning to vibration for the second vowel that comes after and uh, the, the four month transitions also you can see this when this four months you know either go up or go down these are it shows the transition uh, if you make you start with a sound that is low frequency, you transition to, to to a sound that is higher. You can see the frequency rising, or you can see the frequency dipping. So the the release uh, once you release the sound, it lasts about ten to thirty milliseconds. For example, from the the, period, uh, the gap from pa to to the beginning of ah here, that is about between twenty. Uh, to milli to, to thirty milliseconds, uh, or ten to thirty milliseconds. Um, so. Um, the release again in American English, it is not as pronounced or exaggerated as it is in British English. So when you say pat or cat you, in, in, in British English, you see it more pronounced, you know, pam, as opposed to, you know, the American English. Uh, so for the stuff, the um, sound, the energy of the release, when you say pa, pa, or ta, ka, uh, so that energy is mostly between 500 hertz and 1500 hertz, as you can see here in the, the release. So between 500 hertz and 1500 hertz, and that's the range for all of them. So now we're going to go to the alveolar stops. So we looked at the bilabial stops, we we'll go to the alveolar stops. What are the alveolar stops? We said tongue and uh, alveolar ridge. So we have ta and da. So the, the ta and da are going to have the distance between the tongue tip and the alveolar ridge, that this is and the lips. That. That's going to make your, make your um, airway very small, that area where the sound is going to vibrate. And that will raise the frequency significantly to 3,000, 4,000. Now, as you go back, keep in mind, you go back making the stops or any sound, you are going to create greater space. So you can predict now the greater volume is going to make the frequency lower. So 
Then the dealer are going to go, because they have a large gap space here, they are going to go between 1,500 and 4,000. And again, it depends on what the tongue uh, does, if the, what sound comes before or after. Like as I discussed before, when you say eeg, eeg, the, the, the velum is far from, farther. I mean, the, uh, the, the contact is palatal. When you say og, og, the, the, there's a bigger, a bigger amount of space. So that is where um, the, the frequency would drop further if you back the sound up. So for the bilabial stops, the frequency goes between 600 and 800 because there's a rule, there's a law that says if you constrict the lips, then you are going to have a tube that is going to resonate at a lower frequency. Now, once you close, you have all this space here, and um, it will make the tube longer. And of course, as you explode the air, that's going to be also, um, it will engage a big, part, a big part of the lips as well, pop and go. So this, the beginning, when you put the stop at the beginning, that is going to have a special distinctive acoustic feature in, in the way that you produce. For example, you say uh, pile, pile, kyle. So the, the initial, um, the, the syllable initial stops, where the stop sound comes at the beginning of a syllable, uh, is it, it, these stops that come at the beginning of words are characterized by voice onset time, that there's a, a, a a little gap between, a little gap between production of the stop itself and releasing the stop and the beginning of vocal fold vibration for the next vowel, as we described before. So there are different kinds of, four kinds of voice onset time. But voice onset time, that gap can last between minus 20 to plus 20 milliseconds. And for example, voice, the, you know, for voice stops. So what are the voice stops? We have seven of them. We have three pairs, cognate pairs, and we have one that is voiceless, a sig single. So how many voiced consonants uh, stops do you have? We have three, which are, can you name them? B, D, G. How many voiceless stops do we have? We have four. I'm doing them phonetically. I'm not doing them based on spellings. This is how you're supposed to say them. So when you, what does it mean to say the voice onset time for voice stops is minus 20 second milliseconds to plus 20 milliseconds. In some cases, when you make the stop sound, for, for example, let's look at this, the versus, um, versus b versus g. These are the voice sounds. Look at the distance from here to here. That tells you how long you, you paused, you blocked the air. And as you go from the actual production to the next bell. So you almost cannot distinguish much of a gap. However, and of course it depends on the, on the sound that is coming after the, the voice stop. Uh, let's say but When I say the word b, b, banana, banana. So b, as you say it, your vocal folds are already vibrating. So before you open your lips, look, are you vibrating before you open your lips? Yes. So that means your vocal folds begin vibrating for the vowel, for a, uh, before you release the stop. That is what we mean by minus. It can, the, the vocalization here begins minus, minus, I mean, 20 milliseconds before you release the sound. Okay, sometimes based on the context, what comes after, after what comes before, you might release, I mean, the, the, vo the vocal folds might start to vibrate at the same time that the vocal folds begin to release the sound. That will be zero. Sometimes, as in we come to the, um, uh, dull, the, or day, 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 day. So here, day, as you say it before, I mean, you release, you, you vocalize, day day. So it depends on the nature again, what comes before, what comes after. And that is, I just want to explain that this is what we mean by minus 20 uh, milliseconds. It means the vocalization occurs before you release the stop, or it can occur up to 20 milliseconds after you release the stop. For voiceless, okay, for voiceless stops, 
always the voice answer time is, is greater. 25 milliseconds to up to 100 milliseconds. And when I say pam, pam, so eh, and then you start the ah. You make a vocalization. It's a long black, depending, of course, on the context. So let's look at the four categories. And I have a chart here to show you. So here is the glottis, the vocal folds. And we have them uh, in the arytenoidal abduction, ab, abduction, beginning with uh, um, in the breathing mode. Then we have the sound that we are looking for here. We are looking to produce this sound, the puh. The puh sound, as in pile. And below, we are going to make the b as in banana. So the lips, the um, vocal folds, and we'll see how that goes with the, with the pa. So when you say pa, you put your lips together. The vocal folds are, are wide open. You are breathing fully. I mean, I, I, I mean, sorry, they are in breathing mode. But they are quite open, abducted. Um, now you press your lips. You build pressure. Once you start to build more pressure, then the vocal folds will begin, the, the arachnoids will begin to swing the vocal folds to the midline. And now you are releasing, and the vocal folds are not even yet approximated enough to vibrate. And you continue to release, to go to the ah, oh, as in pa, oh, for example. And then you have, you already continuing to release, and finally, the vocal folds begin to vibrate. So that's a long lag, and especially the pa uh, is characterized by that. Now look, compared to the ba, here the vocal folds open in arachnoidal abduction mode and you put your lips together you just begin to close the vocal folds immediately begin to approach to, to come to, to to switch into um, abduction abduction now you hold build more pressure the vocal folds are way approximated immediately here you are releasing the vocal folds are, are starting to vibrate so you begin to continue, you know, that vibration continues, is continued to the second vowel, the next vowel coming after. And simply the vocal folds are vibrating here because the sound itself, the b is voiced. So you can see now the difference between this. So there are two, I mean, four different types of voice answer time. The first kind is pre-voicing vocal voice onset lead. And that is characterized by that minus 20 seconds, up to minus 20 milliseconds. So the vibration occurs before the release. And then zero voice onset is exactly when the release occurs, the vocal folds begin to vibrate. That's zero lag, zero onset, uh, voice onset time. Uh, and then there's, so there are two here, before or at the same time. And the second two are like kind of a opposite of that. So the second ones are usually characterized the voiceless sounds, and they have short lag voice onset time. That means there's a tiny gap between the vocal between the production of the stop and the release into the next vowel. So the vibration follows release right shortly after. And then there's a long lag that can go up to 100 milliseconds, and that is quite long when you go and the pan. There's no vibration, and then you go and. So that you know it can be it could be quite long so these are the sounds i mean there are four types you need to know which they are and you need to be able to list them so now in terms of format transitions you know when you transition from one uh, sound to the other one frequency to, to the next uh, the formats occur as the release of the stops transitions to the next vowel so let's see um go back my system is a bit slow sometimes even though it's Okay, so you can see that when you make the the sound, and in, say especially like after say ah ta, you have the ah becoming very low, and then the the second um, formant is moving from low to high. You can see it is not because the ta is low; it's hitting at a low frequency for F1. And then it, it shows up again in the 4,000, 6,000 range. But here, F1 is going to basically bring uh, R way down, very, very low, 
and then F2 is going to start to, to rise from low to a little bit higher. But F3 will, will transition the opposite way. And you can see, so this, you know, going up and going down, these are the transitions as a result from switching from a vowel into the stop and from the stop into the next vowel. So the formant transitions, again, as you move from one to the next, from a stop to the next vowel, it can last around 50 milliseconds. Um, and the transitions for F1, they start very, very low, extremely low in frequency, close to zero. And then they rise, depending if the, if the vowel or the sound coming after them is, is high frequency, they rise from them. So again, I put this chart here so that we can kind of refer to it um, systematically. So now we concluded the discussion on the stops. We know uh, that the stops are classified in terms of placement into bilabial stops, alveolar stops, velar stops, and gl a glottal stop. There's only a single glottal stop in English. And um, then we look at the, Afri the fricatives and the affricates. And then we conclude after that. We discussed all the liquids previously, the nasals and the liquids, we discussed them at the beginning. So the fricative sounds, we have two labial dental sounds, f and v. Two, so these are a cognate pair, one voiceless, one voiced. The fricatives we have, as you go in a little bit, you have two interdental, also called lingua dental fricatives, the th and the. So that's the symbol for theta is th, as in, um, as in thumb, th, and the as in they, or them, or feather, brother. So then we have two alveolar sounds. So s and z, they're called fricatives because they make friction noise. And then we have two palatal sounds, sh, z, and then we have a glottal fricative. So now, as we trace from the front to the back, keep in mind that the, as you keep going back, the frequency for the sounds that come after are down, like, like these bilabials. Their frequency will be, will be low, I'm sorry, um, labial dentals will come uh, as um, high because there's only a tiny space here to produce them, a tiny space between the lower lip and the teeth, so you have a tiny space around the, below the upper lip. Uh, then, as you switch into the th and th, it is also high, but not as high as, as f and v, f and v. And then you go in a little bit more, s and z, you have more room now, but still it's high frequency. But if when you compare the s and z, it, they will be uh, lower in frequency than f and v. As you go back, sh and z, this will also be lower because you create more space as you keep going back. And then you have the and that even makes it the lowest, and one of the lowest. So let's look at them. and then. The affricates are not a, really, in reality, they are not a new category. It's the, uh, you just combine these two stops, the, the cognate pair, the and the, combine them with sh and z, and the, so you get the voiceless ones, combine them together to make ch, and the voiced ones combine them together to make j. So one sound, one affricate as in uh, chair is voiceless. The other one is voiced as in page and judge. Okay, let's go and look at them. So production of the affricates is characterized by a constriction, partial constriction, and the air streams uh, through the constriction and the space in front of the constriction uh, begins to, uh, is going to resonate. Sorry, uh, I just have to do something here. Um, give you a break from my voice too. So as the air streams out at the constriction, it releases that hissing noise or that friction noise that is going to give it the aperiodic source. Uh, and uh, if, if that sound is voiced, then it will have vocal vibration from the vocal fold in addition to the aperiodic source. And we said that the voiceless sounds are going to have uh, only that voiceless source. They do not have periodic sounds from the vocal folds. So the um, fricatives are the biggest category. There are four cognate pairs and a single. Um, so let's trace them back, you know, from the lips again and back to the vocal folds. If you do this all the time, these sounds will be here, wherever you go. They will be in your mind, you can remember them. So we begin with the two labial dentals, f and v. These are, so to refresh your memory, how to describe them, f is a labial dental, I mean, I'm sorry, always begin with voiceless. Voiceless, labial dental fricative. Now, v. 
voiced labiodental fricative. Then you go in a little, go a little bit in to the between the teeth, and you get th, which is voiceless, linguodental or interdental fricative, and th is the same, but you say voiced. Then you go in s, z, so s, voiceless alveolar fricative, and then z the same but voiced, and then sh palatal, so voiceless palatal fricative. Zh, voiced palatal fricative and the ha is a voiceless glottal stop. So there are four voiced fricatives and five voiceless fricatives. So the labiodentals again uh, require the contact between the lower lip and the upper incisors and the orbicular source is active in pressing the especially the lower part of it and pressing the lower lip against the alveolar ridge. Uh, the lingua dentals, uh, the tongue goes between the teeth, between the lower and upper incisors, and the air streams above the tongue. So, um, what muscle, that's your question, what muscle is involved in production of the lingua dentals? Th and the. That is a question that I answered before, and if you are studying, you should know it. Um, so in terms of acoustics, there's basically not much space to, to vocalize the sounds and to, to resonate. When you say f, f, and th, and th, the, the um, resonant cavity is very small. So that is gonna give them um, uh, for the lingua dentals. It will give them uh, a, a, a frequency that can go up to 7,000. Uh, it begins very, very low, especially in the voiceless ones, but it can go rise up to 7,000. That makes these sounds harder to hear than other sounds. You need to put more pressure to produce them to make them loud enough. Unfortunately, a lot of these sounds come at the end of words. When you say Beth, it might sound as Beth, or uh, it might sound as Beth. And this is where if you are speaking with someone on the phone, they will be difficult to hear because they come at the end, they are low, fre high frequency, and they give that to someone who has a little bit of a hearing loss, they will um, not be able to get that. In terms of the alveolar fricatives, the tongue comes in contact with the alveolar ridge, and we explain that any sound that you produce with the alveolar ridge, you need the, ling the longitude, superior longitudinal muscle to contract to lift up the tongue tip. But that is not gonna make you, you know, that muscle pulls per this way. It is not gonna be able to bring the tongue to the alveolar ridge and compress it. You have to have a powerful muscle, which is the uh, genial, genial glasses, uh, yeah, genial glasses. So again, the, the little small cavity is going to cause the frequency to be higher, but not as high as the sounds before it. The palatal fricatives, which are the sh and sh, they occur at the borderline between the alveolar ridge and the heart valve to the extent that some that some um, linguists or, you know, classify these sounds as post-alveolar, okay? So just be aware, if you see that term, it simply means just at the, be the beginning of the palatal, uh, the beginning of the heart palate. So the tongue forms a groove in the tribe, uh, in the alveolar region, and the lips are um, often rounded for shh actually in the post-alveolar region, at the beginning of the heart palate. And um, again, at the beginning, we still have a shorter space. However, if you compare the, um, the palate sounds, they will be lower frequency than the alveolar sounds. And this will be lower frequency than the ones in front of them. So it's just only a matter of space relationship between the volume and the frequency. So let's take a look at some on the spectrogram. Ah, fa, ah, fa. So even the ah, as it comes before the fa, the intensity of it is not going to be as, as, as significant be, if you come before a voiceless sound, because it's, you are preparing to make a sound just based on noise in the oral cavity, a uh, fa. So that sound uh, is not going to have very clear formats as, as opposed to the one that follows. You know, now we have, you know, have switching in from the fa to the a, uh, a uh, fa. So that becomes more pure tone than the, the other one is not very clear. Uh, when you say now, compare this, to a voiced consonant. Now watch, the fa, very, very low because of the noise, um, the fact that there's no periodicity, and you go up way to 8,000. Oh, that noise continues very high frequency. And the fa is a very hard uh, sound to hear at the end of words, like this as well. So, and there's a big gap where a lot of air is released off 
fa, a lot of air is released here in the zigab, and then you move to the vocalization for the ah, ah, fa. So now look at how clean and how clear this is compared to that, because this has no periodic source for the fa, but this one has uh, voiced, um, uh, you know, it th th doesn't have as much noise. So ah, va. So this, v that noise from the contact between the lower lip and the tongue, it blends in, it comes in above the 6,000. And then it starts to, but when you say of, so at first you don't have enough of that friction, but at the end you have it coming very high frequencies, and then you switch and you see the transition. Um, the first you say ah, it dips down towards the v, low frequency for ah, f1, and then you move on, it goes up again. And for f2, slightly kind of stays steady, but then you, you go v, and then you, you move up again a little bit, rising up to the ah. So um, now look at the fa. You will see all of this all the time. There's more noise in the higher frequencies here. For a tha, you can see that occurring between uh, 3,000 and 8,000. Uh, but when you say a tha, you can see more of the sound coming before it having clearer formats and we have here uh, less of that noise band. Um, and as you switch to, to both vowels, uh, you can see the, the transition to lower and then rising again to the a uh, because fa very low frequency. You can see also a uh, sa, uh, sa, all of this band of noise coming in the higher frequency and uh, compared with z, uh, za, here's less, and this marks again the voiceless part of the sound, and this marks more the voice part, but they blend then. So a uh, sha versus a uh, ja, a uh, ja, um, here and here, you can see all of this darkness and all of this is noise, and it is very high in frequency, but here it is less noisy. And it, um, you see the transition now, the R is low, uh, but 900, but F2, I mean, for, uh, for j, j, first for F1, it dips down low and it rises, but then it rises more, see here, toward the J, because it has, um, and the higher frequencies, you get the noise coming in from the vocal tract, from the oral cavity, I mean. So now, look at the last one. The ha, the glottal fricative sound. I say the glottal fricative because English only has one glottal fricative. English only has one glottal stop. So if you simply have a question that says, uh, write a word or tell me a word that has the glottal fricative, that means the only glottal fricative sound. That is the purpose of why. We use these descriptors and describe the consonants, we describe the vowels. Each one has a particular name, like your name is um, A, B, C, D, your fourth last name. The, this, the vowel will have a fourth last name, so that when you say the, that name, saying the fourth, like my name, Ahmed, Muhammad, Abdel, 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 one, two, three, four, you can't mistake you know, that because I am going to be distinguished if I sit in a room where there are a thousand people and you call that name, I'm going to stand up, no one else likely. Maybe in Egypt you'll have like fifth, maybe many people standing up, so you go to the fifth name. But but in any case, we make for each consonant the three descriptive words that only apply to that consonant. So when you say that consonant, you know it only applies to that particular one. And so if we say the glottal friendly notes, the the glottal stop, only the up. So to produce that sound, you bring the vocal folds in approximation very similar to the whisper mode. So, and then you increase subglottic pressure and the air pushes through, and that is gonna make the friction that as the air streams between the vocals, it kind of streams in between, it makes that friction, but the vocal folds themselves do not vibrate. Um, so then the uh, fricative sounds in general, they are, uh, the, re the resonance is going to depend on how much space do you have between the constriction and the lips. And the more the space you have, the lower the frequency, and the less the space you have, the higher the frequency. So, for example, it's go it goes between 4,500 hertz and 7,000 hertz, as we could see here. See, between in, in, that, in that range here, most of the activity of it is focused here. You look at th, see, between... 3,500 uh, up to 8,000. So they, they have quite a high frequency. Th, th, as in bath, the voice less. It goes 5,000 and up. So again, that means, remember, as the frequency increases, the volume decreases. 
So that means higher frequencies need more pressure to produce. So in terms of the affricate sounds, affricate sounds, we said there, you, you start with the stop, voiceless stop, and you release it into a voice fricative. So you get the ch, you combine a, a voiceless stop with a voiceless fricative, you get the ch, as in chair, catch, match, and you combine the uh, voiced, voiced, le, uh, uh, alveolar fricative, uh, I mean, voiced alveolar stop, duh, combine it with the voiced palatal uh, fricative, you get the affricate j. Affricate is not really hard to write. So please put F and F and just make it the C-A, affricates. Because I get very strange spellings. And if you don't write it correctly, I will say to you, I do not recognize any sound as such. Okay, if you write it in a, you know, the spelling. Yeah, some people have dyslexia. However, when you come to particular concepts where one sound is going to make a difference, it switches the word into another word, and you are in the field of speech language pathology, then you are expected to know when it comes to the word switching meaning. You deal it with, you deal with it as a concept that you have to put a lot of work on memorizing and, and knowing the difference. Um, so, in here, the Africans are going to give us features of the stops as well as the fricatives, because they are a combination, of course. So we, first we have a silent gap, because you stop, or and then you voice that into a, uh, you release, and then you release the blockage into a friction, uh, a friction noise that is the fricative sound. So here, look at this. Uh, cha, uh, cha, uh, so here, uh, and then you stop, you block for the t, all of this gap is for the t, uh, and then as you release a cha, you start to get the ch release between uh, maybe above 2,500, and then it goes up there. We can go up to a 7,000 or more. So now look here when you say ah, uh, I'm sorry, ah, uh, ja, ah, uh, ja. So you don't see that noise, much of it, as you could see here. You only see just a little bit. And then the, the, the gap here is shorter than the voiced here. You block more for a longer time. Here you block for a shorter time, but then uh, you see you get the noise in the oral from the oral cavity, um, just about the same place, but it's much less than for voice less. And then you, you see the, how beautiful the the transition is. Uh, a jaw, a jaw. Then you get almost the um, the anti resonances here uh, that we just actually affecting the ah simply because of the context itself. So a uh, jaw, you have a significant. Uh, uh, blockage just going to make uh, more air resistance and also that will uh, cre create damping so you get these vertical bars that we know as the anti-resonance but you also see the the transition how the j is, is low frequency and then you move to the r it starts to rise uh, even um, even uh, i mean 900 and then you can, you start to get uh, the f2 is, is, is lower because j is going to give you noise in the higher frequency but for the r you come down more so now that we have discussed all of our um, uh, vowels, fricatives, and affricates, and you looked at the acoustics of them, and we'll look generally just in a few minutes at the, some features, especially co-articulation. That's a very important concept because we do not speak in single sounds. We speak where we combine, you know, sounds with sounds to make bigger units, to make, uh, to make uh, syllables. And when we speak always, every, you know, most of the time a sound comes before another sound and so on. So that creates a context and environment and the sound lives in that environment and is affected by it. Uh, I mean, imagine this, when you say electric, how do you say that the s at the, at the, at the end, say k, electric. Now, if you add I, T, Y, how do you say the word? You are not just going to say it as, um, you know, just simply by switching the, the cut into C, but you, the whole way of saying the word will switch into a different way, electricity. So you switch the stress um, uh, placement as well as you make changes to the actual sound. So, but co-articulation is the way in which two or more articulators move simultaneously to produce two or more different phonemes at once. So, for example, and that is more of like anticipation. You want to be effective, you're... Um, organs of speech 
kind of try to start to get ready for the work before you start doing the work. Like when you read, your lips are reading the first word in the sentence, but your eyes are way at the end. So your eyes always precede what your lips and articulators are doing. Otherwise, you will not be able to read fluently. So let's take an example like, say, for example, um, E, say K, 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 and put your lips at your corner, um, index fingers around the corners of your lips. Eh? K, 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 K. Do you notice any like movement at the corners? Like, do you go like this? Do you go like this? So you simply just, it's neutral, K, neutral sound by itself. Okay, so let's put the sound after K. I'm going to say put E after K. So E is retracted. Now, before you say the word, now it's key. Key. So, but how do you say it? You say, and before you actually start saying the K, your lips are retracted. So you are making a K that is retracted. So key. So you are blending in features of the production of the E and with the features of the production of the K. You are making two sounds at once and uh, the articulators are moving in to make the two sounds at once. So you anticipate and your lips take on the characteristics of the second sound, the next sound coming in. How about this? Um, if you say, um, cool, cool. Before you say, oh, your lips are now rounded for the K, even though the K is neutral, K, but you say cool, good. So that is an example of co-articulation. Again, making two or more um, sounds using two or more articulators at once. In terms of intonation, tone is a sound. In tone is to create music, to create tones that go up and down. You say that intonation is sometimes called melody of speech or music of the language. So it is um, sometimes called prosody, prosody. So intonation is the manipulation of the patterns of, uh, of the stress patterns to show what kind of speech act you are engaged in. A speech act is basically what is intended by what you are saying. So I say to you, call me at night. What is that speech act? Interpretation. Well, I am giving you an order. Okay. So if I put the word, please call me at nine, what's the difference? Call me at nine. This one, please call me at nine. First one, the speech act, the intention of that speech act. Okay, so speech act is the intention beyond what you say. So call me at nine, I'm giving you an order, a command. Please call me at nine. That means I'm requesting from you. I'm not giving you an order, I'm requesting. And we know, all of us know that a request is more polite than a command. If I say to you, um, what are you doing? What are you doing? So what is my intention what is my speech act what kind of speech act am i making and you notice i'm raising my pitch that means i know what you are doing but i do not agree with it that is ridiculous and i convey this only based on my tone of voice you see how i manipulated the stress patterns what are you doing so but now if i say what are you doing that means i am now intending my speech act as a true question i do not know what you are doing please tell me like maybe on the phone i'm talking to you um i don't want to make this about speech acts, but there's a whole theory called speech act theory. And it, it details, like if I say to you, good morning, what kind of speech act am I giving you? I say, greeting, and, and I'm acknowledging your present. I'm greeting you. Um, it can be an invitation. It can be, so it, again, look at the inten intended purpose of an utterance that you say to someone and that intention will be the speech act. For example, am I asking the speech act is a, a question, uh, informative uh, or seeking information? or uh, expressing scorn or expressing, um, you know, for example, um, negation, like negative, like no, or, or I'm not gonna, like you ask someone say, uh, could you do this for me? They say no. So that's a speech act of negation. So anyways, the way that you manipulate the stress patterns that will, um, you cannot do this unless you put in the necessary intonation. When you do that, you can make 
a question change into a statement or a statement into a question or a joke, something that you, you say lovingly to someone might be taken seriously based on the intonation. And we said that the intonation uh, depends on the stress. Stress applies to a syllable. It doesn't apply to a single sound. A spell is stress, I mean, I'm sorry, is tense or lax. Tense vowels. The seven tense vowels, you go back to the vowels at the beginning, like U, E, A, and all the tense vowels, seven of them. You, you, typically, they occur in syllables. When they occur in a syllable, they make that syllable stressed. Okay, so we say a syllable is stressed. For example, object, object. What object are you speaking about? So I put the stress pattern at the beginning of the word, object, object. At the first syllable, the energy, more energy from the muscles will, will, will be exerted when I say the ah at the beginning, object. But then if I switch the stress pattern to the second syllable, then I neglect, I spend less time and energy on the first and I stress the second one. So I'm going to say object, I object. So object now changes the meaning completely because of the stress pattern. So, and, and single words have a stress pattern that's different than uh you know speech uh, stress patterns we, we make because we want speech to be musical so we redistribute the stresses based on what comes after what comes before uh, in order to make our speech less boring and more animated because if you do not ma manipulate your intonation and uh, vary the stress pattern remember the variability rates um of uh, intensity variability and uh, frequency variability when you go up and down in frequency by 20 to 35 hertz up and down as you speak uh, and you go in intensity by 10 decibel uh, up or down, that is that is the substance of intonation. Changing, going down and up, up and down to create these waves in order to make the person more engaged. If you do not do that, the result is going to be monotone, mono pitch. And as you continue to speak in monotone and mono pitch, you have the same loudness, you have the same tone or the same pitch and the person just give them 10 to 20 seconds they will fall asleep guaranteed because you will sound just like a machine speaking and especially if the person is speaking and standing in the same spot for a long time when they are giving a presentation and they should bring a pillow to be ready to sleep okay so that is the idea of intonation and why it is important let's connect that to what we did before we started before we said that if someone has a voice disorder that is going to restrict any problem in the vocal folds that will restrict their ability to use intonation uh, in terms of pitch and loudness and their speech their speech will be monotone and it will be not as effective so now stressed syllables i remember again a syllable is stressed all words that are single uh, words uh, especially single syllable words like chair leg arm nose face um, chin, all words that have a single syllable, they have one primary stress, okay, by nature. When a word is more than one syllable, only one of the two syllables or more has, can have what, the primary stress, only one syllable. You have one primary stress and you put it on the most important syllable in the word. So stressed syllables have uh, three different characteristics that you need to know. A stress, like when I say object, produce um, above uh, alone alone um, perhaps so the syllable that's stressed has higher frequency and has in increased because of the increased vocal fold tension it has higher subglottic pressure and it has a longer duration because the vowel in that syllable is, is tense. It takes longer time to produce and that makes the entire syllable longer um, because the syllable cannot be a syllable without having at least have one vowel. Okay. And, and then in stress syllables, most often the vowel is tense. So the uh, stress syllables will have greater intensity, will be louder because they have higher subglottic pressure. So I'd like you to know all this and as I say object. So you notice when you say object, object. So you put a lot of muscular force, a lot of energy to produce these sounds in terms of frequency and in terms of um, uh, intensity, loudness, and in terms of the time it takes so that your muscles are working for a longer time. So again, when you have single words, all words that are monosyllabic, they have one primary stress, they are stressed by nature. 
uh, a word that has two syllables or more is going to have one primary stress that's the most distinctive, the most important kind of stress, but there are secondary and tertiary stresses. They should study this in phonetics and linguistics, maybe. Um, so when you put words into syllables and syllables, I mean, uh, syllables into words, and then words together in one sentence, the sentence itself is going to dictate what kind of stress uh, you can alter the stress pattern in a sentence because um, you are going to make some words less important than others. Like, I want to go to the store and buy something. When you say and by itself is stress, but if you say I want to go and, then it doesn't become stressed. I want to go and do meet, meet this person. So, or stand up and so up is not going to be stressed. So, anyways, the, the context of the sentence is going to dictate uh, uh, changes to the uh, uh, stress pattern of words. Okay, we have successfully finished this one without having the system um, kick me out. And now we are going to start to plan for the next unit, which is the auditory system. And that should be really, really interesting. And then finally, after that, the nervous system, which is a lot of fun. I hope you'll be ready for both of these. So um, thank you. And again, write uh, direct uh, questions. And I hope that you go back to these lectures and use them as a resource to go back and check uh, your answers to the questions you make to test yourself. Thank you.